So welcome to another one of our webinars, this one looking at uh, identifying and dealing with conflicts with Dr. Fran Chester from the University of Queensland. Before I hand over to Fran, can I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands um, from on which we meet or from which we're meeting electronically. Um, we're in base, we're here in Brisbane, so we acknowledge the Turbal and the Yagara people as the traditional owners of the land that we now call Brisbane. Pay our respects to any elders and ancestors and welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us here today. Um, the um, issue that we're talking about today is now is conflicts of interest, um, which is a very live issue in a lot of community legal centres and I think that's reflected in the number of people that are joining in today for this conversation. Um, and it's great that Fran has agreed to present another webinar for us um, looking at this specific issue. Uh, both through the context of uh, the law and the rules, but also thinking about some of the practical implications for us in our practice in community legal centres. Uh, we're hoping to have a recording of this made available and we'll email around a link to that and a link to Fran's PowerPoint uh, as well. Um, there are a couple of ways that you can ask questions as we go. Uh, one is to press that button that looks like a hand on your control panel. We'll see your hand go up, we'll be able to unmute your microphone and you'll be able to ask a question that way. The other way that you can ask a question is to enter a question into the questions box, surprisingly enough. Um, I think that's the administrivia dealt with, so I might hand over to Dr Francesca Bartlett who's a senior lecturer at the UQ, uh, at UQ in the TC Byrne uh, School of Law, um, who researches, teaches and knows a lot about um, legal professional ethics and uh, the rules and the, uh, the way that we should um, think about things like conflict which are issues that come up every day in community legal centres. Um, and Fran, over to you. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. that's great. I assume yeah. so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. For, thanks for joining in. And um, as usual, uh, my apologies for being somewhat Queensland-centric um, in this talk. That's where I'm coming from. But um, I will try and raise aspects uh, that obviously apply to all practitioners around the country, but also where there's some differences, most particularly in relation to the jurisprudence in Victoria about this idea of continuing loyalties, and I'll explain what I mean shortly. Um, I thought I would, uh, if you will indulge me, take uh, a, the sort of 40, 50 minutes um, uh, to speak uh, somewhat because I have also included uh, many of the sort of scenarios and, and questions that have been emailed through. They're fantastic. Thank you. Um, and they will obviously also direct me as to coverage of what really is a, a completely enormous topic that um, I can't cover in this short amount of time. Um, but I will attempt to deal with some of the issues that have been raised because they're obviously ones that are important to you and your sector. And I do really want to try and uh, talk to you in your sector. Um, but again, a sort of apology, you are very specialised more than me in the substantive areas of law in which you work, which very much dictate uh, how some of these conflicts arise and how you best to deal with them. I'm talking, as James said, from my kind of experience as a, a researcher in professional ethics. Um, so I will do my best to uh, address the topics that have been raised. Um, and, and let me start by talking about your sector uh, because it's the sort of frame of, of reference for me in terms of thinking about how I um, talk about the law. Um, you are uh, in many of your practices a sort of generalist in the sense that you must deal with what walks in the door presumably, but you're also very specialised insofar as you have really vast experience dealing with the common issues arising for your clients. Now these are very different clients to say the corporate lawyers who I mention here of course because this is the sector that really tends to generate the common law uh, case law about conflicts, that is the injunction cases that of course I'll have to refer to. Um, and these decisions of course are about the firms rather than the lawyer individually, or it could be but it's typically the firm, um, but it might derive from the lawyer um, and the movement of lawyers across that sector. And your sector is also very different, interestingly, I think, from the typical person, and here it's the lawyer, not the law firm, who arises in the other area of, of um, law generated, which is the discipline and case law, 
um, which is uh, decided by various tribunals, um, as prosecuted by legal services commissioners, as uh, charges against the lawyer for unethical conduct under the Legal Profession Act or the Uniform Law if you're in Victoria and New South Wales. So in this jurisdiction, in fact, what we see is the kind of um, 40 to 50 year old white man practicing alone or with a couple of colleagues in the suburbs, typically in areas like wills and states, conveyancing small transactions. Um, that is a pretty universal picture that um, one sees and has been well documented by academics um, in Australia and elsewhere. Um, and indeed there is some critic, uh, a critique of this by academics that the jurisdictions, uh, the, the prosecutors in these jurisdictions are kind of going for low hanging fruit. Um, they point to the very small demographic being prosecuted, but also in respect of, or so action in respect of behaviour, which is really just clearly breaching uh, professional norms, um, or indeed is just uh, reacting to uh, clearly criminal behaviour by the practitioner. My point here is that the jurisprudence that I have to deal with does not really address the much more complex questions that we want to go to here about where to appropriately draw lines in balancing equally important um, considerations like um, professional duties and public duties, that is uh, duties owed as between multiple clients that you might have or between clients and the justice system or indeed between the, the lived experience of the lawyer and the clients. Um, so I will do my best with the case law that isn't a fantastic fit either for your sector or necessarily for those more difficult questions um, about where to draw the lines. Um, now I, I thought I would just take another minute to kind of uh, ponder I guess somewhat academically about why it is that we just don't have very much case law um, in this area about your sector. Um, I mean I guess in relation to the expense of civil litigation, um, applying for an injunction in the Supreme Court is probably beyond the means or interests of, of many of your clients I suppose, um, although I'm not sure that they would necessarily have qualms or any more qualms than the sort of one-off um, client of a private practitioner making a complaint against a CLC lawyer to the, to the Legal Services Commissioner. And indeed there is some evidence that that does occur um, in some reports, uh, one report in particular coming from Victoria, um, but really the complaints are um, very, very far and few between in relation to conflicts either against your sector or in relation to private practitioners. Um, there are no disciplinary cases as, as far as I know of in Queensland or elsewhere dealing with conflict situations uh, arising from the community law sector. Um, why is that the case? Well, one of the reasons might be in fact that um, you are actually a very careful and well-managed sector. Um, you have uniform and well-implemented risk management systems, you have guides available for workers in your sector through insurance accreditation scheme, uh, which is uniform. Um, for some of the sort of bigger organisations, if we include legal aid in this, this sector, of course there are comprehensive guidelines and I know that um, you also have one coming from, from um, the, the umbrella volume of NAPLAC. Um, there was an interesting report a couple of years back produced by some academics, um, Louise Kyle and, and others for the Victorian Law Foundation about regional lawyers and conflicts. Um, and one of the things that they found when they spoke to quite, quite a few um, regional and rural lawyers was that in what they conflated as one sector, and I can see that's problematic and I'll come back to that, uh, being community legal uh, lawyers and um, Victoria Legal Aid lawyers was that they tended to um, refer to the guides and uh, 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 be dictated by them when they were assessing whether a conflict was arising, whereas by contrast older regional practitioners tended to just kind of rely on their gut instinct. Um, now I'm not making evaluations as to what is better, but that seems to be a really di different kind of um, uh, uh, set of, of um, uh, resources that the lawyer is referring to when they're making decisions about how to manage or whether a conflict arises. 
I mean, I, I, I also kind of mention here that in, in relation to the disciplinary case law, um, it's worth noting that as a matter of prosecution, really these tend to arise where the lawyer has been pretty intransient um, in their approach to, to fixing a problem. You know, they've refused to apologise or to, to accommodate the situation. Um, and they've often already acted on the conflict really to the detriment of the client. So a, a mistake in, involving a kind of reasonable interpretation of law is, I think, extremely unlikely to re result in a disciplinary prosecution. Um, and so we don't just don't see those going through the courts. Although I do mention a couple of them just to, to give some examples of, of where they have arisen in disciplinary prosecutions, but you'll see that um, they tend to be where the practitioner has clearly uh, cross the threshold to the detriment of the client. Now, the courts, in terms of the injunction cases, um, take a somewhat different view and their uh, threshold is, is much more, um, uh, is much higher arguably and is much more kind of prophylactic, which is the slide you can possibly see on the right. Um, this idea of, of imposing upon the lawyer uh, an obligation to foresee into the future any conflict that may arise and to deal with it before it arises as a matter of, of professional duty. I'll come back to those in a minute. Um, the other source that I use here, which I think is really um, useful in Victoria and is a real difference around the country, is um, uh, the Law Institute of Victoria has ethics rulings, which um, I would uh, uh, encourage you to have a quick look at because there are enormous enormous amounts of, of conflict rulings uh, in that jurisdiction, a lot to do with family law, which of course is an area of, of um, real difficulty and real need, um, which makes many of these conflicts arise. I will use some of these, um, and I think one of the things that is reflected in them is that there's a real safety approach where uh, the conflict appears to arise. They are suggesting that it would be unethical for the practitioner to act. So assuming that um, the safety first approach is the general approach and assuming that the CLC sector uh, is um, approaching that in, a, in a, a cautious risk management way, the question then arises about how do we break this to the clients. Um, and I've had a number of comments come through about this and again that uh, report, the regional lawyer report raised that as a significant concern for practitioners in the regions and, and particularly in the community sector, um, turning away clients who are confused and angry about why they can't be represented is a, a really unpleasant uh, experience for the lawyer, but also, of course, um, is really questionable if we're thinking about access to justice. Um, Fran, I, sorry, sorry for interrupting. Right. It's James here. I think yeah. we're having some issues with the slides. I had a few people suggesting that we can only see the first page, and that's the case for me yeah, here. I haven't quite got there yet. I'm so Excellent. sorry. Just checking. I am going to flick. Good one. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, I'm just raising that issue. I'll keep moving on um, about this idea of breaking it to the client. Um, all I can suggest from first principles, which I'm about to get to, is that... Um, uh, there is no particular confidentiality in, in who your client is, um, but of course I, I understand that there may be practical um, concerns about uh, telling somebody who arrives at the, at the, the um, office uh, why you might have a conflict, but I'll, I'll come back to that point in a minute. Um, now there's another threshold issue that I wanted to raise, but perhaps uh, given that uh, you're concerned about me getting through the slides, I can come back to. But this is an, a, a distinction, um, and again it came up in some of the questions that I've received, as between the attitude of legal aid um, and the community legal sector about risk management. Um, legal aid, uh, after the um, Senate inquiry into legal aid and access to justice, um, has really been thinking about this idea of discrete services or unbundling legal services as it's often um, named, uh, and uh, has a, a particular approach which um, thinks that, that we can be much more permissive when we're thinking about conflicts if in fact the lawyers are working in these very compartmentalised ways. Um, I'll come back to, 
to this in terms of, of thinking about it through the first principles, but um, can I say maybe from my ivory tower um, and uh, perhaps controversially that I'm not sure that it's entirely wrong-headed, this approach, um, but there is a really difficult balance, I think, and we need to do a lot more research and I'd be really interested to hear from, from you guys in the sector about what you think about this because I think that there are some really good public interest concerns on both sides of, of this argument. Um, on the one hand, making sure that we don't apply this across the board. It may be completely inappropriate for areas in areas like family law where there is an expectation of continued representation or where the client might be at risk in sort of domestic violence sorts of situations. Um, there was a really interesting decision in uh, England in a case called Sharon Minkin and Landsberg, which goes, I think, a step further than we go in Australia. Um, it is, though, in the context where family law uh, has, of course, been completely defunded um, as, as a matter of, of legal aid. Um, and Lady Justice King in the Court of Appeal kind of specifically looks at that and um, changes, arguably, the standard of care applying to lawyers providing this kind of compartmentalised, that little bespoke service in a family law matter. Um, she says, legal aid is no longer available in financial remedy cases, no matter the level of hardship caused to the protagonists or the complexity of the proceedings, without becoming embroiled in the effect of this legislation may have on access to justice. What is indisputable is that one of the consequences of legal advice not being available uh, is that where an unrepresented divorced couple reaching an agreement, um, uh, they are faced with the challenge of producing that. Um, and then she goes on to talk about how complex it is in family law matters to even get into writing a, an agreement as between the spouses. Um, and so she says, finally, in order to address this problem, a number of solicitors specialising in maritime finance cases offer bespoke or unpacked services whereby they will undertake to act for litigant in person in relation to a discrete part of the case. She says, there would be very serious consequences for both courts and litigants if solicitors were put in a position where they felt unable to accept instructions to act on a limited retainer for fear that they and what they anticipated to be a modest inexpensive drafting exercise may lead to them having imposed a far broader duty of care to do a range of things. Now, of course, she's talking here in relation to civil liability of lawyers rather than conflict, but of course, it's on the same um, spectrum. What seems to be, she seems to be anticipating is that there may be a, a, a really contracted um, a scope of duty which also might limit the sort of standard of care in some ways are uh, very much driven by this public interest in allowing access to lawyers in certain cases. Now I'm not sure that that represents the Australian law which I'm getting to now but um, I just kind of frame the discussion in that way to say that we, we could be moving in a very different direction. Okay so let me begin with some of the uh, first principles. Um, the formal uh, way that the law regards conflicts of interest for lawyers is in this kind of prophylactic approach, as I mentioned before, that the lawyers are there to be the gatekeepers of, of the law. Um, we are the ones with all the knowledge uh, and we are supposed to be um, foreseeing any problems that might arise. Um, and of course we can't solve those problems by simply passing the client to an associate because we also have this idea of imputed knowledge within an organisation which raises a huge amount of conflicts of interest. Now what the common law and also the ethical rules contemplate though is that informed consent can be a cure for many forms of conflict of interest that arise and perhaps this is something that we could think about more in the community sector, although again there are a lot of countervailing um, practical and, and um, sort of policy issues that arise there in terms of the nature of the clients, um, whether they can provide informed consent. Okay, so there are a range of conflicts uh, that can be described in these ways um, and I think it's really important to get this in your head at, at the outset because um, sometimes what seems like a really complex issue actually 
uh, can be can be uh, solved quite easily with these sort of first principles. So there's the obvious one that many people think of, which is um, a same matter conflict acting on two sides of the matter. Typically, that is an actual conflict that uh, may, in fact, even not be able to be solved with informed consent of the client. Then there are a range of loyalty conflicts which come out of this idea of the fiduciary relationship. Um, and these are a couple uh, where it might be that there is no issue of confidential information, but um, the client, the lawyer is either working um, for two clients in not on uh, other sides of the contentious matter, but in a related matter where their interests may be adverse or may diverge. Um, and then, of course, it might be that the lawyer, one lawyer in the firm is acting for one client um, and another lawyer is acting against that client, but not in the same matter. And again, that could be a conflict of interest. Uh, it might be uh, the much more usual situation where we get a lot of case law where um, a lawyer has previously acted for somebody, they have confidential information which has been passed to them, that confidential information must be kept uh, until the lawyer is released forever. Um, uh, and that could cause a conflict because that information is then relevant or material to the next client that they hope to take on. There is a quite a lot of case law to suggest that um, the, the threshold of concern um, is much uh, is much higher, uh, there's much more concern um, where the matter is contentious rather than a non-contentious matter. But as I will explain, there it is a mistake to think that just because, uh, for example, a lawyer is active for two clients, where they both are quite happy to instruct the lawyer, husband and wife, asking for a will to be drafted, that there are no potential conflicts on the horizon or, and that nothing needs to be um, done even at the outset about that. Okay, so there are three grounds which I'm sure you know and I will uh, assume <laughs> that you know um, for the law to intervene, of course, so this idea of a breach of, of duties of loyalty, um, misuse of confidential information, and then this rather a sort of ephemeral one, this idea of the law intervening, notwithstanding neither of the, the, the above two, that there is some perception um, that the administration of justice will be endangered. Uh, this often arises, of course, in the context of things like um, familial relationships of the lawyers. Okay, so I'm sure you know the kind of remedies, but these, of course, generate the two sources of, of law that I've already referred to, that is the injunction cases in particular in civil context and also uh, disciplinary cases as a matter of a breach of ethical rules. Um, the ethical rules and the um, common law really uh, mirror each other, although arguably at times the ethical rules are uh, more permissive of management of conflicts, I think, than, than the courts have been over the years. Uh, in this respect, of course, they are the same. It is this idea of acting in the best interests of the client um, in both professional ethics and also, of course, as, as a matter of fiduciary law. In the ethical rules, it is contemplating that that is only the case within the client relationship, that is, until the end of the contractual relationship. Um, the common law is the same. Uh, it is a fiduciary relationship that we are concerned about in relation to this idea of, of duties of loyalty that are conflicting. Of course, as a matter of, of Australian fiduciary law, it doesn't really have any content. It's really only about, um, uh, it only kind of comes into effect where somebody acts against the interests of the fiduciary. Uh, so how do we get the content? Well, the content is dictated by the contractual relationship. Um, and it is, as I began, in this way that maybe we can start thinking about um, whether we do uh, think that we can, can um, deliver services in situations where we might have thought there was a formal conflict, if in fact we can arrange the uh, relationship between lawyer and client at the outset such that we can work on the limited basics. There is some Australian case law to suggest that that is the case. Um, a case, for example, that I talk to my students about, a case called Fortune and Bevan in Queensland, 
was a situation where a lawyer uh, provided 20 minutes of advice uh, for $20. And the client was very clear that that was all that the relationship was. It was very preliminary advice. Um, when the client then expect, uh, sued the lawyer in, in relation to kind of not having followed up and not having confirmed the advice, um, that the lawyer wasn't found to have, have um, breached their duty of care because that scope of relationship was so limited. Of course, whether that translates into the conflict of interest cases is, is another story. Um, now, the duty of, as I said, the duty of loyalty only continues within the relationship in Queensland. Um, apologies for just Queensland. Uh, Queensland and I think the rest of the country except Victoria. Now, Victoria has a different line of cases um, coming from what Justice Brooking said in Spinner Code. Um, and there's, you know, I've given you another case, that breakfast lawyers, that follows that particular decision. And indeed, the um, ethics rulings from the Lord Street of Victoria also apply this, this case law in, in their advice to practitioners. Um, now, there's been a lot of discussion about exactly what was meant by a kind of continuing duty of loyalty beyond the retainer. Um, uh, I think that one way to look at, look at it is that Justice Brooking didn't actually mean that much, um, that in fact all he meant was uh, that where um, the lawyer acts in a same or related matter of, against the client that they were just acting for, that that um, is going to be a breach of, of uh, a sort of a, a continuing um, expectation that the lawyer will not act against the interests of the client. Now in Spinner Code, um, there really was quite bad behaviour of the lawyers where the lawyers had worked in a, um, a, a corporation context and then was working for a couple of shareholders without telling anyone and then they brought a shareholder action. Um, so you can see that perhaps the court was very unimpressed with um, that particular conduct. Um, it may be in fact that really what's happening is that there is just a reverse onus um, of proof imposed upon the person who's applying for an injunction. That is usually you have to show that there is um, a basis on which the court ought to intervene but here it might be that the, it's, the onus is on the lawyers to show why uh, they should be allowed to act. And I think this is really similar in the ethical case law as well. There's this very strange case of Fordham, um, a Western Australian decision, but it's referred to um, elsewhere, where a lawyer acting in a criminal context um, put her former client of only a few weeks ago on the stand uh, when acting for somebody else. Um, and was subject to a discipline um, finding. Um, and the court talked about this idea of an ethical duty not to adopt a position hostile to the former client in a related matter. And she complained and said, well, I don't, don't have any continuing duties of loyalty. I didn't use any confidential information. Um, sure, I learned some of that information in my former client retainer, but it was in the public realm. But they said, no, for a matter of professional ethics, it's a really bad look for the practitioner to then use that information against their client to cross-examine them on the, um, on the stand. Now, how far we can extrapolate these cases, I'm not sure, but um, they seem to be suggesting that uh, there is some expectation that the lawyer doesn't kind of just change sides, as it were, or use material that they have gleaned within the former relationship against the client. Okay, so uh, as I said, the content of the duty of loyalty depends on the contract by and large, although there may be a continuing duty of loyalty in Victoria. Um, what does it mean? Like keeping client confidences, of course, and that continues on beyond the relationship. Um, and it also means this other thing, which is what is the key to where conflicts arise at law, typically. The obligation is to tell the client all that the lawyer knows that is germane to the, the representation of that client and, of course, to prefer and advance the interests of that client within the law. And we get this from that very famous case, which you've probably heard of, Spectre and Jeter, where uh, Justice Marjorie says, a solicitor must put at his client's disposal not only his skill but also his knowledge so far as is relevant. And if he is unwilling to reveal his knowledge to his client, he should not act for him. What he cannot do is act for the client 
and at the same time withhold from him any knowledge that he has. And therein lies the rub because if the lawyer has knowledge from a former client, they are obliged to tell it to their current client or their potential client, in which case you simply can't take on the client um, in the first place. Or you ought to know that you cannot. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is the way the conflicts arise. Um, let me get to the ethical rules, which, are, as I said, mirror the um, common law. Uh, let me begin with the ethical rules associated with this idea of, of duties, uh, ongoing duties of loyalty um, in relation to two clients. Um, we have a, a blanket prohibition in Law 11.1, must avoid conflicts over between two or more clients. But then it goes on, as I kind of introduced at the outset, to anticipate a situation where uh, with client informed consent, the lawyer may be able to act. However, I think it's really important to note that there is still lawyer discretion expected here, that the lawyer isn't just being dictated by the client as I want you to continue to act, but does exercise forensic judgment and decide whether it is in the best interests of the client. So we don't dispense with that kind of fiduciary obligation um, to continue to act in the best interests of the client. So that the rule says, um, if they seek to act for two or more clients, where their matters are adverse and there is a conflict or potential conflict, um, then they can only act if it is still in the best interest of the client and that each client knows and gives important consent. Uh, now I've left out a rule in between because that's dealing with this idea of confidential information which I'll get to in a moment. Um, now it goes on to say if a conflict of interest arises, so it may be that rather than dealing with it at the outset, so we've just established that you ought to know as a lawyer that if you, for example, have confidential information, you can't take on a client, another client where you'll have to use it. Um, but it may be that you have two clients, you've done your conflict check, and nothing comes up that suggests that their interests are adverse to each other in any way, or there will be any kind of conflict of duties to each other, but then something emerges. How can you deal with that? Well, the ethical rules suggest that uh, the law practice can continue to act for one of the clients, so you can dispense with another client, and um, you can continue on with the other client, but it has the very important proviso at the end that the duty of confidentiality to the other client is not put at risk and the parties have given informed consent. Now, it seems to me that that will probably be a rare situation, that if a client has been told that that um, you can no longer act for them, that they're going to give you their consent to continue to act for their adversary. Um, but it is potentially uh, a course of action and ethical. Although I do note, um, again, sorry, this is a Queensland um, thing, uh, the commentary in the Queensland Australian Sisters Conduct Rules advises that really this would be in the rarest of circumstances and generally um, consent can't cure an actual con conflict and the lawyer really must not represent either party, that is, that the party can't really give informed consent um, or that it's impossible not to put the client at risk. Um, so uh, actual conflicts, um, I'm talking of course about the idea of acting on two sides of a case. Um, and we have the, the uh, well-known case of Prince Geoffrey, which is good in Australia, but this idea of um, it being at the heartland of the fiduciary law that, that uh, you can't act on two sides of the case, nor cure it through passing it to your partner. Um, nor can you um, use a situation that has just arisen uh, as um, you can't say that it wasn't your fault, um, you are supposed to have foreseen this. And that takes me on to a really interesting recent case where a lawyer um, uh, did not foresee a conflict of interest, not arising in the um, uh, paradigm case of um, two sides of, of another 
of a uh, litigation, but rather in a non-contentious matter where the parties had come to the lawyer uh, as, as, as friends, they wanted to be tenants in common, purchasing a property, um, the lawyer was to do that particular transaction for them. The lawyer um, also uh, drafted and, and kept a deed um, between, one of the, between two parties that one of the parties would advance um, money to the other. Um, then the lawyer received uh, advice from one of the parties, Mr Bell, that he didn't want to uh, continue to own the property and he was going to sell his interest, and he was the one who owed money to the other client, um, and asked the lawyer to assist him to sell his interest in that property. The lawyer agreed to assist, didn't tell the other client, uh, and ultimately there was a complaint made to the discipline tribunal. What I think is interesting is the way that Justice Thomas dealt with this particular case. First of all, he, he noted that um, those kind of latter actions were uh, manifested then as an actual uh, conflict of interest and the lawyer acted on that to the detriment really of, of both clients. The facts of the case, said Justice Thomas, demonstrate the dangers associated with a legal practitioner acting on behalf of more than one party in any transaction. Even commercial transactions where at the time the lawyer acts, the interests of the two are not in conflict. As a result of acting in the transactions, the lawyer will obtain information on both sides, which in the event of dispute, they may be under a duty to disclose. Um, uh, the lawyer, of course, didn't disclose that uh, information to one party that the lawyer ought to have, and of course the lawyer acted against the interests of the other party in um, assisting that other party to um, sell their, side, their part of the, of the property. So what he suggests is that the lawyer should define what will happen in the event that the position between the parties becomes contentious at the outset, and he provides some um, suggestions about how you might do that. One of the things that he suggests is that um, in non-contentious matters where the parties come are uh, happy to be uh, advised by one lawyer, that the lawyer of course suggests to them that this may be imprudent, that one of them might need to get uh, legal advice elsewhere. Um, suggest to both of the parties that as part of the contractual arrangement that they um, agree that everybody tells everybody everything, so the lawyer does not get caught in that first case of conflict of interest, which is knowing something that they really need to tell the other party. Um, so what um, this case is useful for is that a disciplinary body is thinking about the ways in which a lawyer can, by the nature of the contract, manage a potential conflict that might uh, foreseeably arise. Ultimately, in this case, the lawyer uh, was found to have engaged in unsatisfactory professional conduct and uh, was, was fined and reprimanded. Okay, um, now of course it comes up in other cases, there's an interesting uh, decision recently in uh, Queensland um, uh, in relation to criminal representation of, of co-accused um, where the Court of Appeal, um, uh, the, the court um, noted the, the, and I quote, the very real danger of conflict of duties where a firm of solicitors or a legal practitioner acts for two or more clients in same or related criminal matters. Uh, the court said it had been a long-standing and reasonably common practice for solicitors um, to act for one or more co-defendants in criminal matters, um, but it is a practice fraught with danger. The practice is apt to undermine public confidence in the legal profession and should be discouraged unless there is no possibility of a conflict existing or emerging, and such cases will be rare, co-defendants should have separate legal representation. Um, so there is no ban on this particular activity, but the court was really warning about the uh, foreseeable dangers that might arise. Now, of course, as I've said, the sort of um, immunisation for the lawyer uh, in many of these cases is this idea of informed consent of both parties. The ethical rules contemplate that it will be consent given in writing, which isn't required at the common law, but um, I guess this could be practice for the lawyer. Um, and it is a very fulsome idea of, of informed consent, uh, that the client uh, is given enough information such that they can understand 
and can agree to, for example, a limited representation being provided by a lawyer or their uh, confidential information being provided to another party, for example. There is also um, ample case law to suggest that the lawyer ought to at least advise and possibly insist on the client also getting independent legal advice in order for the lawyer to continue to act in a conflict or in a potential conflict of interest situation. Now, of course, the difficulty with this is, um, as I foreshadowed, that informed consent can be difficult to obtain, not least because it might be difficult to explain to the client why a conflict arises, um, but also uh, where the client is particularly vulnerable or where the client um, may be seen as being particularly um, able to easily swayed by the lawyer, uh, where, for example, they're in a very isolated place with no access to lawyers, the client's going to be particularly um, vulnerable to the suggestion that they agree to um, an arrangement which may not be particularly in their interests. Courts are attuned to this notion of informed consent. Um, okay, so um, let me give you a few examples. Uh, this is, as I said, an um, application by um, uh, somebody to the Law Institute of Victoria. Um, it is somewhat like uh, an example that's been put to me, uh, and so I've, I've picked up this one in particular. Um, here, there's this situation where the fundamental question in the end is who is the client, um, but it can arise in a situation of a child where the lawyer is faced uh, in, in practice with this idea of having um, multiple clients who, whose interests might diverge at some point, parents disputing um, what they want to do in the client's interests. So here there's a four-year-old child with a disability, brings a medical claim. Um, the parents uh, ultimately um, have a dispute about um, the quantum that, that they, the outcome that they want. Um, the parents sort of, sort of uh, sought guidance from the ethics committee in relation to um, having two different uh, instructions from the clients about how to deal with the resolution. Ultimately, um, the ethics committee uh, suggested that the, law, that the uh, lawyers could continue to act in this situation, but where the, uh, one of the parents was um, given uh, independent legal advice in relation to the matter. Okay, so let me move on, because I'm very aware of the time, uh, to this issue of confidential information. And, and this is really a very common, much more common situation, um, because it typically arises uh, where there is not two clients who have uh, adverse interests, um, but rather where there is a former client um, as a matter of, of practice. We all practice for many, many years. We have multiple clients. So there will be multiple former clients whose confidential information we have either on file in the firm that we work in or in our head. And the distinction between the two is one which is a difficult one at law, I think, and I'll come back to that. Um, so what I've given you here is just the ethical rule, Rule 9, which requires us to keep a client's confidences. Um, it is only information that is acquired during the engagement um, and it can be shared within the practice, which of course brings in the um, uh, assumption at law that um, it will be shared um, amongst the practice and therefore um, there is no uh, cure for a conflict simply passing a client to somebody else in the law firm. I'll come back to that point. Um, now, I've, I've already said this in another webinar, but um, there, there is a lot to be said about confidential information. I, I simply can't talk about it here, but I do remind you that um, confidential information is, is a very broad concept, particularly when we get to um, its relationship to conflicts. So while um, the, the, the broad ethical requirement to keep confidences is tied to information only gleaned within the client, relationship from the former client, that is, um, when we get to Rule 10, which is dealing with uh, conflicts arising as between a former client and a current client, um, a former client is actually defined very, very broadly under the Australian Sisters Conduct Rules. So 
Um, what it means is that any information that a lawyer has learned um, from uh, their client, but also um, for, from uh, that has been learned by somebody that they work with now, but they learned it in a former uh, firm, is going to be imputed to that particular lawyer and, and constitute a conflict. So it is a very broad um, definition. Of course, it has to still be confidential, um, uh, but the nature of the information that might be relevant to the new client and constitute a conflict um, is again very, very broad. So we talk uh, a lot uh, in a lot of cases, particularly in cases associated with uh, family law matters, about this idea of getting to know your factors, litigation strengths and weaknesses, um, maybe enough information to constitute a conflict for a lawyer. So let me give you a couple of examples though um, before we get too carried away with this idea. Uh, again, the LIV ethics rule is useful, I think. Husband, um, uh, who was a solicitor in a particular practice then has a dispute with his wife, um, a family law dispute. The husband asserts that the firm who he used to work for uh, uh, cannot act for his client because of the conflict because they have confidential information about this idea of getting to know your practice, that they know something about him having been a previous employee. Um, uh, the Law Institute of Victoria felt that that was not a sufficient, um, uh, that, that was not sufficiently known to the firm um, to constitute a conflict of interest. Um, Another example, uh, the wife objected to practitioner acting against her in a family law intervention matters. Um, uh, the firm had not actually acted for her, um, but she had been to the practice with him um, while he was seeking advice previously uh, in relation to a, a building dispute. Um, uh, and uh, they then uh, sought to act against her in, in, in um, family law matters. Um, the law firm said that they had never been instructed by her and hadn't received any confidential information for, from her and that was um, uh, enough for, again, the LIV to, to say that they didn't think that there was any conflict of interest because there was neither the basis of uh, any kind of conflict in duty of loyalty nor was there any confidential information that they held um, uh, of hers that they would then need to trans to, to um, pass on to her husband. So one of the points that uh, could be made here is that we need to look at the decent, the facts of the particular cases um, uh, to really um, decide whether a conflict arises as a matter of first principles, not to immediately say, well, there's uh, a class of people here, um, we can never act where uh, we've had any relationship with the husband or wife um, in these kinds of, of scenarios. Okay, so um, that's the, uh, I've been talking about the ethical rules, of course, here is the um, injunction uh, cases, uh, the injunction um, case law in um, its bare principles. The onus is on the applicant uh, to show that there is a uh, there is confidential information held by the lawyer, that there is um, a materiality of that confidential information to the uh, new client that the lawyer wishes to take on, and that there be this risk of disclosure. It must be real, not merely fanciful. And in Australia, we apply the Prince Jeffrey test of a real possibility, the lower threshold of the probability of the test. Um, now the other thing that I think is important to say and, and was raised in one of the questions is, is there a sort of a difference between types of matters and that the case law suggests that there is at least, particularly in relation to family law matters, that there are a number of cases where the threshold is lower or at least uh, or there's a broader test or perhaps a reverse onus on the lawyer, um, a mere theoretical possibility that there may be uh, disclosure is going to be enough. Um, what might that mean? Well, one of the things that some of the cases suggest is that, for example, even if it's not the lawyer but perhaps the support staff um, that have information 
that might be enough of a theoretical possibility that there will be a disclosure of the client's interests to constitute a conflict of interest. So it is uh, a more vigorous test applied in those cases. Um, now that's not to say, of course, that a lawyer can never act against a former client. Um, and there has been a number of cases where the courts have, have um, been you know, really concerned that there might be um, a, a, a sort of a blanket bright line test applied here without looking at the specific facts of particular cases. So you see in that English case at the bottom there, in rear firm solicitors, they um, are concerned about a, a timid reluctance to risk some imaginary appearance of conflict which has no substance. Um, they're reacting to this idea that should the lawyer have ever acted for a client, they could never act against them even in an unrelated matter and without the concern about a slippage of confidential information um, that they see as, as not required by the law. So we need, we don't want to, um, uh, we, we need to be careful to keep these first principles in mind when applying to specific cases. I've given you a list here and I'm, I'm not going to <laughs> read these. Um, you can have a look at them yourself. I'm just trying to think through what are the real possibilities that might um, come up. Um, and as I said, uh, the family law situation might be one where the, the possibilities are slightly wider than in other contexts. Uh, now, the, just to quickly go back to those ethical um, rules, the uh, uh, in relation to the former client, um, you must avoid conflicts, um, but really they only arise in relation to this this, form, this confidential information that you are keeping. Again, um, there is a management that is available ethically under the uh, ASCR if the client gives informed consent. Now, the rules say or, but again, it is generally felt that that is probably lower than the common law expectation that there also be an effective information barrier. Um, now, I haven't said much about it here because um, uh, um, there's only so much I can say, but obviously an information barrier is a significant concern um, in small practices. Um, that, that is just not something that the law will allow. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that if I get a chance in a moment. Um, obviously, in relation to current clients, it may also be a concern about a slippage of confidential information, and the same rules apply in Rule 11, as I've just described. Uh, again, client conf consent and information barrier may allow the lawyer to act. Now, there's uh, a last situation that I um, uh, wanted to mention, which is a situation where, um, for example, there is uh, not adverse interest, but rather there is a common um, uh, opponent. Um, but there is a difficulty here, I think, where um, one former client, the, the, the current client, uh, doesn't know about the former client. Uh, sorry, that's right. The former client, sorry, doesn't know about the current client. Um, can um, the lawyer, what can the lawyer do in this situation? Well, one way, of course, is that consent could be sought, but in order to, to seek consent, the law firm needs to tell um, the former client about the, the new um, partner. Um, this might be okay, <laughs> um, but of course, uh, that probably is a breach of, of the client's confidentiality, and it seems to me that it may raise a range of issues associated with the safety of, of either or both of um, the former partners in these situations. Uh, it raises that question about is there any end to the conflict? Um, if the situation uh, arises as a matter of conflict because of confidential information that, that is known from that former client, then I think the answer is simply no, it doesn't have an expiry date um, because, of course, that confidential information must kept, be kept forever. However, uh, where it is at this notion of uh, concurrent duties of loyalty, they end when the contract expires. Um, and it may also be that in situations where um, 
uh, where the confidential information is a passing um, uh, knowledge and is not particularly relevant to the new client, then um, the affliction of, affliction of time perhaps does um, come into play. Um, and I just mentioned that Cock and Brown, which is a very different context, I know, to the community sector. But here it was a, a recent um, Victorian decision where um, a reasonably junior lawyer was working for uh, a very large law firm, um, Freehills. She then moved to DLA Piper. Um, and there was concern about knowledge that she had. She had been working on a file for a client that was then um, uh, taken on by her next firm. So we had this idea of imputed knowledge of her to um, the next firm that she worked at. But the court was quite practical um, about their approach and it was very specific about the facts before them. Uh, it took account of the fact that she had, was a junior lawyer in the previous firm that she was dictated to um, in her work. She had a limited knowledge of the um, transaction. Um, they took account of the fact that she gave evidence that she didn't remember the information that she had received at the former firm, that she was not given access um, to that file anymore because she had moved. Um, but also, of course, what was key in that case was that in the large law firm sector, um, there was an information barrier that was able to be erected such that she would not be um, working on the, the file of the new client, such that any kind of memory of the, the previous work that she had done would be triggered by her working, uh, nor could she pass it on. Um, now, maybe this case isn't particularly useful for people in the community sector, but what it seems to me to suggest is that the courts will um, be quite specific about the facts before them, um, that they are prepared to uh, be convinced that um, there is no danger to the former client of slippage of their information. Um, and uh, they, are, they will allow the law, the law firm to proactively manage that uh, in a way that, that um, can allow the law firm to act. And, and the, um, the court specifically did acknowledge the movement of young lawyers as between law uh, firms and the necessity for the law to accommodate these kinds of, of practices. Now, what, what does that mean for a community sector and any case that comes before the courts? Would they, for example, adopt something like the English Court of Appeals approach to um, uh, allowing access to justice in defunded family law matters? Would they think about those public interest questions when, for example, um, there's a question about a volunteer who works uh, in a clinic one day and then goes back to their large law firm? Um, I'm not sure the answer to that question. Perhaps it turns on the availability of um, separation of lawyers, uh, the availability of um, lockable drawers and um, various other ways of, of actually physically separating um, clients, uh, client matters such that there is a disadvantage of knowledge. But perhaps it does suggest that the law is not quite as inflexible um, as it might seem at, at first instance. Now, I'm aware that I'm kind of at time, James. Um, and have you got much more content prepared, Fran? Well, look, I, I can talk, and I'm happy to keep, to, keep talking. I, the, there are another set of questions that arose in relation to um, another t species, I suppose, of conflict of interest, which is, um, where the lawyer, the, the lawyer's position conflicts in some way with the client's. Um, and so there's a whole range of situations that might occur, um, in particular, for example, in small communities or Indigenous communities where there's um, a, a large sense of community or, or family affiliation. Um, is there going to be a conflict of interest arising all the time that's unmanageable? Um, I mean, I, my short answer to that question is that there's nothing, uh, there are no ethical rules that prohibit somebody working for a family member. Um, but of course, from all that I've just said, um, there is 
uh, a concern about this idea of a duty of loyalty. If the lawyer cannot act fundamentally in the best interests of the client, then perhaps they ought not to act, which might be endangered where they have some personal interest in the case. Um, uh, there are a range of other issues that can come up in relation to funding also that I can talk about, but I can talk about them at another time because I'm aware that we're um, very close to time. No worries, terrific. Thank you, Fran, for that um, presentation. We might just hang around for a few minutes if people have got questions because I think there was a lot yep. uh, coming out of what you were saying. Um, just a reminder, a couple of reminders to people who have tuned in. Um, we will hopefully be sending around a recording and a copy of Fran's PowerPoint um, in the next little while. Uh, so I think that will alleviate some concerns. So there have been some uh, questions coming in about that. A couple of ways that you can ask questions, folks. You can press that button that looks like a hand on your control panel, um, or you can type a question into the questions box. Um, I might just editorialise for a minute, if I can, um, Fran, about uh, putting some of this stuff into context. So last year, um, and for the last few years, community legal centres across Australia have seen more than 200,000 clients. So that's uh, individuals with whom we've formed a client relationship, which means that we're providing legal advice and or casework, um, not information or education or other activities. Um, and over the last 15 years, we've averaged two complaints. So about one in every 100,000 clients that comes through the door um, is claim is uh, making a complaint that's subject to a paid claim. And over the last 15 years, I don't think any of those have been in relation or, or the cause of those complaints have been based in concerns about conflict of interest. So I think this goes to uh, some of the points you're making very early in your presentation, Fran, that, um, and can I apologise, we've got some building going on here, so there might be some being um, going on behind me. Um, it goes to your point that um, community legal centres, for a range of reasons, including um, the lived experiences of our clients, the types of services we're providing um, and the way in which we deliver them, um, these types of matters are less likely to come up than in other parts of uh, the profession. I think that's a testament to the structures that we have in place and the way that people work there. Um, I might, um, Helen McGowan, um, I might, you've had your hand up for a while and I know that this is a massive area of interest for you. I wonder if you had any comments or queries coming through, Helen. Just go back to the needs of staff. Have a look at it because I initially had B2B and then I, I just, my connection was slow here and I was trying to get it to connect and then all these other B2Bs came up and I thought, oh, well, that's not us. But if, if, can you have a look at it and just give it some support because we can go back to something more consistent with all the other names. Which will make sense. Yeah. I think we might not have got Helen at the best time there. I wonder if anyone else has any queries. Um, Fran, our risk management guide says that um, it, when we tell a client that we can't um, act for them, and this is something I think that came through in some of the queries that you had, we tell them that we can't act for them. Um, the I think the risk management guide actually says um, that uh, we need to be mindful of our existing clients uh, or our duty of confidentiality to our existing client. Um, it doesn't actually say that we can't tell uh, the, the other person um, that we can't act for them because of a client, but it says we need to be mindful of the um, confidentiality of our existing client. I wonder if you can think about or maybe suggest some ways that we can do that in a... Um, in a way that doesn't kind of um, irritate the new person who's come in the door, that we're saying that we can't act for them, but we can't tell them why, which I think is practice in a number of CLCs is, is an entirely unsatisfactory yeah. experience for that potential new client or the client to whom we're accusing services. To just say, sorry, I can't t help you, but I can't tell you why I can't help you. Yeah, yeah, look, I mean, I, I, I completely appreciate why the client would be um, very unimpressed with that. Um, I think, um, I mean, one one way, I guess, that we could attempt to, to trans, translate the, um, this for the client is to explain exactly the, the basis on which we um, believe there is a conflict. That is to um, 
say to the client, well, um, the difficulty is that I can't act for you in the way that you want me to act for you. Um, that, that if I took you on, I could not tell you really important things or act absolutely in your best interest because I've got these competing duties which I can't dispense with. Um, now, whether that, you know, whether that would be satisfactory, I don't know, but perhaps um, it would you know, show some respect to the client that um, uh, when we represent them that we're trying to represent them absolutely to the best of our abilities uh, using all of the available uh, information that we have. And if that's constrained, then our representation is going to be less than, than satisfactory. Um, I don't know what you think of that, James, but um, I mean, in essence, that is what the courts are concerned about when they're thinking about conflicts of interest. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really tricky one. I'm just, I guess I'm concerned about the client experience and where it's such an unsatisfactory answer. We need to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think from some of the comments that um, are, uh, were emailed through, there is a concern. I think that there's a, there's a, a hypersensitivity about conflicts which is very much concerned about you know, the lawyer's professional re reputation and, and less concerned about uh, access to justice. And I think that's a very real concern in the sector. Um, and, but it's a, it's a difficult one, I think, um, because, of course, the lawyer needs to keep practising and they need to um, uh, have, have uh, you know, particular practices that they can apply easily um, rather than trying to work on sort of a gut feeling that may in fact be um, uh, pan out to be a, a wrong decision. And, and one of the stats I think, Fran, that kind of reiterate that, I mean, the NACRAC census was released a couple of weeks ago and it showed the community legal centres took away over 169,000 people across the country and the major reason that they did that and uh, almost 80% of um, responding CLC said that the as a result of that said that the number one reason that people were turned away was because of conflict of interest. So it's a very real issue for us in terms of making sure that um, we strike an appropriate balance between um, all of the stuff you've spoken about today and ensuring access to justice across uh, through the services we provide yeah. across the country. Yeah, well, so one, um, one solution, as I, I sort of tried to foreshadow right at the start, is, um, and, and was a... Um, submission that was made to that Senate inquiry by um, the uh, what used to be called Q-Culture Law Rights uh, in Queensland was to have an amendment to the ethical rules to allow for um, this idea of some sort of limited representation, even um, on opposing sides, actual con uh, uh, conflict of interest situation, um, obviously where there's client consent. Um, but to allow that to occur more often in very, very limited ways. Um, and legal aid is contemplating that that's um, uh, available and, and appropriate. Um, and that's perhaps something that needs to be thought about more um, if there is this real concern, particularly in um, uh, regional areas or areas where access to another lawyer is really limited. Trippy. Fran, I think um, I'm just um, I'm not sure if I'm going to do the question justice that's just come through, but it's in relation to court lawyers. So you made the observation earlier about um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff members of CLCs and some of their broad community and family connections and the impact that that might have. When you come from a um, a community uh, newly arrived or um, community of people, um, it's similar kind of considerations that you might take into account there where um, staff members from those communities uh, might have particular links that might make providing legal help um, a little bit more difficult. Tatiana, I'm not sure if I've done your question justice there, but Fran, um, essentially similar considerations. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I, I think I think the answer is um, that we have to use the first principles that we have. So there is no prohibition on working for a family member, um, ethically or at, at law, but there may be a range of ways in which the conflict arises easy, either because of the loyalty question that you can't um, uh, 
you can't act with undivided loyalty in that particular case or you can't act with competency in some for some particular reason to do with that relationship. Um, and then what I didn't sort of get to, in fact, excuse me, I'll just flick through um, to, uh, there is also this other um, uh, basis on which a court can enjoin a lawyer, which is this idea of a sort of a, an apprehension of a, a lack of, of proper administration of justice. Um, it's a bit like the bias test. Um, the reasonable, fair-minded member of the public concludes that the legal practitioner should be prevented in the interests of protection of the integrity of the judicial process. This particular um, basis has been um, a basis in which uh, family members have been enjoined from acting in certain cases, so not where there's been a confidential information problem, but where there's been a, a sense that um, the process will be unfair, um, particularly in relation to different spouses, so very close familial relationships that arises. Um, it can also arise in relation to um, a, a, the case in Queensland that we often refer to as the Crown and Zabo, where there were um, a sexual relationship between the prosecutor and defender in a criminal matter. Um, the court there was mostly concerned about the lawyers not having disclosed the nature of their relationship. Um, but nevertheless, there was no sense that there was actually anything wrong with the process. It was about apprehension of an unfair process, so that kind of apprehension bias idea. Um, so there are some dangers, I think, uh, here, but um, uh, perhaps the best way to deal with it is to try and look at it on a case-by-case -case basis in the sense of what is the nature of the, of the matter and the nature of the relationship and does it endanger the lawyer's ability to act um, uh, in the interests of the client um, or would there be this real apprehension of um, the process uh, seeming to have gone awry if the lawyer acts in this case. Um, uh, where, for example, they have a familial relationship um, and they're acting against somebody, that might be a situation where an injunction might apply. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, I, 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 think, I think it's a really genuinely difficult question, um, but uh, is not necessarily one that I can give you a, a blanket answer about, and certainly there are no ethical rules that go directly to this. Um, there have been in other uh, jurisdictions that attempt to deal with this. So in New Zealand, for example, um, uh, there are some limitations on working for family members. Um, in the uh, American Bar Association rules, um, they ban a lawyer acting um, when they're in a sexual relationship with the client if that relationship arises within the client lawyer-client relationship. So it doesn't um, predate that relationship. Um, so there have been some attempts to deal with that situation, but we don't have any formal ethical rules that deal with it. Uh, I'm not sure what the message to take from that one is, but uh, thanks, Fred. Um, I might just cross Helen McGowan, um, one of our colleagues who's been doing a lot of work in this space. Helen, I wonder if you've got anything that you wanted to add? Oh, g'day. It's so fascinating. Thank you, Francesca. Um, Look, my interest is in what I'm hearing from uh, lawyers, what they do, like in a sector, is something like a triage assessment. So it comes in that they do the data match. Uh, all it is is really like something's interesting here and they call for the file, they have a look at it, and they uh, go through certain steps. And typically when they go deeper into it, um, they've discharged their duty to address the positive law, the settled law on that area. They do a comprehensive file note and then they will make that decision and if it is to go ahead and provide a service that they've done two things they've exercised their ethical duty to pay attention to the settled law but they've also uh, used their creativity their ethical courage to actually say we are going to provide this service we're not going to be uh, frightened away by the the possibility probably remote possibility that um, someone is going to be disgruntled and I think the whole way our sector works is that we're, we're preventative um, but and we're consultative and it's very unlikely that people are going to get cranky and sort of 
and if they do, we address it when it comes. So my particular interest is in culture change within the community centres, that we, we, we get behind more of that robust and practical approach. So um, my question really is around what are we going to do about this 80% of people being turned away because of the risk management guide? Mm. Yeah. And I, I might uh, take a shot at that, Fran. I think uh, it's a conversation that needs to continue happening, particularly at the PII network for um, community legal centres, um, because I think there's a bit more work to do um, based on some of the stuff you've been doing, Helen, um, amongst others, to think about ways that we can make sure that our services are accessible as they can be within the professional framework in which we have to operate. But I think you're right, the balance is a little bit out of whack at the moment. Great. Yeah. Well, I, I'm really glad it's on the agenda. This has been so comprehensive. Thank you. And also the opportunity to, to listen into some of that more um, recent law that um, I was unaware of. But at the same time, it's all appeal cases. And it's, to me, it's all positioning of the big end of town with the people with the deep pockets. That, that is hmm. not our client base. But, but I think what's interesting, yeah, look, obviously that's correct. Um, I think what's interesting, though, and that's what I was trying to bring out, was that um, I think there's a, you know, there is a, um, a sense that the courts are prepared to listen to the underlying public interest sort of issues that are arising and um, uh, to, to, to be attuned to those when they're deciding the law at least. Now where they would go with that I don't know in relation to your sector but my feeling reading all of those injunction cases about the large law firms is that where the courts tend to be quite um, technical and, and pick, picky is where they feel that it's just about um, financial greed of the large law firms. Um, uh, actually, there's a really nice quote by um, Justice Byrne in that uh, Village Roads showcase, so in um, relation to a large law firm hitting a client, um, and they complained that you know if you if you have a strict idea about conflict of interest, we're never going to be able to take on any clients and. Um, uh, he said, to my mind, this is a price that the clients of such firms and the firms themselves pay. The firms have found it commercially convenient to become large. This is but one disadvantage of this trend. It certainly is no reason for the courts to weaken the traditionally high standards of the practitioner's loyalty to the client. Um, now, that sounds harsh, but I mean, I think that they're, they're concerned there about this sort of idea of commercialisation. Now, they may be really very different in a different context where access to justice requires the lawyers to be um, uh, much more uh, creative and consultative and, and looking at a case-by-case -case basis of when they take on a client. Um, so I think there's room to say that the, the case law may allow for the sorts of, of approach that you're suggesting, Helen. We've gone well over time. Thanks, Thank that's you. really interesting. Sorry, Helen. No, I was just saying thank you. It's just great. Thanks, James. Thanks, Francesco. Really good content. I had nothing to do with it. It was all Fran. So, Francesca, thank you very much for um, this presentation today to add to um, previous ones that you've done to us. We really appreciate your support and putting it in a way that um, covers the legal issues but really thinks about both the philosophy and the practice of why these things are important in our everyday practice. So on behalf of people clapping and cheering wildly at computers across the country, uh, Francesca, thanks for this presentation. As I said before, folks, we'll try and get a recording and a copy of Fran's PowerPoints around to you uh, in the next day or two. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, tuning in. Um, thanks for those messages of thanks coming through to Fran as well. And we'll look forward to speaking to you all soon. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.